In this fifth episode of Beta, let's catch up on everything Google. Welcome to Google I.O. As many of you may know, last month was the annual Google I.O. conference here in the Bay Area. And I want to take a look at Google from the perspective of what the company presented at that conference. So let's split the episode up into two parts. And in the first part, talk about everything mobile, uh, Android L, and the updates to the Android platform, as well as Google Play. In the second episode, let's go and take a look at how Google is intending to disperse its computing power among connected devices like televisions and wearables. So what was most interesting to me was how Google is judging the health of its platform based on how many engaged users it has. For some perspective, Instagram has about 200 million users, whereas Twitter has 250 million users. And WhatsApp has about half a billion users. And of course, Facebook is at about one and a quarter billion. So for Android to have one billion active users is really, really significant, especially in terms of mobile web services. We are over one billion 30-day active users. As of this CSIO, Android tablets account for 62% of the overall market. We care about usage. Another metric of engagement is app installs. Just this year alone on tablet is up by over 200%. We have paid out over $5 billion to developers on top of Google Play. It's increased two and a half times from $2 billion the year before. It seems that both Google and Facebook are actually in a race to reach 5 billion users. Our goal is to reach the next 5 billion people in the world. Emerging markets. And the only way any of these companies is ever hoping to reach that number is by focusing on emerging markets or the developing world. Because in these parts of the world, that's where the most population growth is happening and where the most people live. So by bringing computing to them, both these companies have an opportunity to not only learn from the data that's supplied by these users, but also to sell their attention to advertising companies and the highest bidders. And with Google and Facebook's experience at bringing computing to scale to large amounts of people, uh, both these companies really have the capabilities, talent, and opportunity to hopefully bring computing to more and more people throughout the world. This would be not only advantageous to the people themselves, but also to companies that wish to sell things to these people. So really, it's a huge market out there, and I'm glad to see Google focused on that. At Google I.O., we learned that Google is hoping to reach this market by focusing on offering its computing services through Google Play to other companies out there that are hoping to build hardware. Android One. By building a reference platform, Google is hoping that other companies will focus on the job of creating the hardware and getting the parts, putting them together to build cheaper smartphones, while Google offers them not only the reference design, research and development that went into that, but also, and more importantly, the internet services through the Google Play Store. So we are working on a set of hardware reference platforms. It's the same software you see running on stock Android. Through Play, we allow OEMs and carriers to add locally relevant applications on the device. We provide full automatic updates. One example device which we are working on so that at scale, we can bring high quality, affordable smartphones. So while Google hopes to grow in the future through Android, it still has to stay focused on building and keeping Android fresh through its upcoming L release. L release. 5,000 new APIs for form factors beyond mobile. And at Google I.O., we learned that Android is going through a phase of cleaning house. I like to compare it to a TikTok cycle that goes on in computer chips that you may have seen in one of my past videos. One year, uh, a platform owner will focus on design. And then the next year, they'll focus on APIs and uh, cleaning up their software code base. This year for Android L, the focus will definitely be on design. What if there was an intelligent material that was as simple as paper, but could transform and change shape in response to touch? Material design. Those scenes and shadows provide meaning about what you can touch and how it will move. App developers to specify an elevation value. Easily colorize all framework elements in your app. Baseline grids that work across screens. Start with a design on a phone and logically and easily bring that same design to tablets and laptops. Here you can see step by step how we update the design. Typography, the grid changes, and finally the surfaces and bold colors. And a few small changes make a really big difference. 
And you can also see how easy it is to take that same design to different screens. And Google is hoping to bring many of the material design functions to the web through web APIs. Today, we're bringing you all of the material design capabilities to the web through Polymer, a powerful new UI library for the web. Bold graphics and smooth animations at 60 frames per second. User experience, a shared hero element. For example, an image that starts in one activity and animates seamlessly through translation and scaling into another. Fire up the phone dialer are those bold material colors and shadows. The ripple touch effect, as I touch each of these tabs, and you get a more subtle material touch effect on the recent calls. The dialer button has its elevation set, so it's floating above the UI. And as I tap it, you get these really nice, delightful animations, nested scrolling. As I scroll upwards here, you'll notice that the recent call to Marcella will start to shrink and disappear. Then the search box will start getting pushed upwards, and the tabs will lock into place. And you'll see that ripple touch effect again emanating out from the buttons. Also offering APIs for notifications. Interactive access to notifications right from the lock screen. I can swipe down, and I get my full list of notifications. I can double tap on a notification to launch the corresponding app. Or if there's something I don't need, I can just dismiss with a single swipe. And I'm going along here, about to get my highest score ever. And then all of a sudden, I get a call from Marcelo. If I want to act on it, I can answer it. Or if I'm busy, swipe it away. And authentication. And personal locking enables the device to determine if it's in a trusted environment. It uses signals such as locations you de designate, Bluetooth devices that are visible, even your unique voice print. Because I'm wearing a Bluetooth watch, my phone knows it's me who's present. And so it doesn't challenge me with an unlock. If I take my watch off, as a result, my phone will lock down its security. It presents me with a pin lock. And in Android L, Chrome is also getting a refresh. At the beginning of last year, we had 27 million monthly active users of Chrome on mobile. Today, we have more than 300 million. Not only is the UI more polished, sharing many of the design APIs that enhance the Android L platform. So first, let's talk about material design. The title is on a blue background that was actually programmatically matched to the painting. And if Tom clicks on uh, to expand the card, you'll notice that it filled the screen with a continuous animation. If he scrolls, the header will shrink. It won't pop into place, but it has a, a smooth animation. Now let's go ahead and click on the suggestion at the bottom to get more of Van Gogh's artwork. And you'll see those search results also smoothly animated into place at 60 frames per second. But it also offers more functional features, like a more enhanced Recents tab. Let's go ahead and click on that Recents icon in the lower right. Tom's Chrome tabs are also listed here as well. We're making it really easy for you to move between the web and apps making multitasking just that much easier. This change to Chrome is actually built on top of a new API in L that allows apps to populate multiple items in recents. But Google is also bringing search to app content on the Android platform, allowing users to not only get results from the open web, but also from specific apps that are already downloaded onto the device. So last fall, we announced app indexing. As Tom scrolls through the search results, you'll see Close to the top, there's a link for the homepage to Waterbar. Instead of going to the website, it's actually going to take us to the OpenTable app because Tom happens, happens to have the app installed. So let's go ahead and click on that link. And you'll see it takes us directly to Waterbar within the OpenTable app. If your app requires you to, your users to sign in, you'll, use, you'll be able to use Google Plus Sign In in the coming months to have your public content show up in search as well. He's going to do a search for Fairy Building. And what you'll notice at the bottom of the screen is there are search suggestion for Fairy Building Marketplace in the Google Earth app. And this is there because he, this was the app that he was using when he found that tour before. With a single click, he'll get taken directly to the tour of the Fairy Building within the Google Earth app. But any app that utilizes this new API will have the same capability. Now, you've probably heard me talk a lot about APIs, and I wanted to take a second to just explain a little bit why they're a major point of contention in a lawsuit right now pending between Oracle and Google. API stands for Application Program Interface, and all you really need to know is that it's a way for software to talk with other software. APIs allow software to do all kinds of things, like load programs into memory, fetch data from the GPS, uh, take pictures, store pictures, Basically, any functional thing that you can do on a device is controlled at one point or another by an API. Now, above APIs, there's something called a runtime, which is a software layer that actually loads the operating system into memory. Now, the problem for Google is that 
Since most of Android is written in Java, Oracle actually owns patents and copyrights to many essential Java APIs. So after the iPhone came out, the Android team rushed to try to create a new platform based on Java APIs. But instead of rewriting code word for word exactly, they basically rewrote the code in their own words to accomplish the same task. And while Oracle didn't say anything at the beginning, uh, as soon as it became apparent that Android was going to become a thing, Oracle decided to take them to court in 2010. Now, the initial ruling was that Oracle did not have the legal standing to copyright APIs. If Oracle had been given copyright over APIs, then they wouldn't be able, then other companies wouldn't be able to use those without Oracle's permission. And so to make a long story short, Oracle appealed and the second judge overturned the first ruling and now Google is left with a lot of trouble on how it's gonna manage its platform. But this year, Google came up with a solution by creating a new runtime. Let's start with the Android virtual machine because the L release runs exclusively on the new Art runtime. 2x improvement performance over Dalvik. All of your app code just gets the performance improvement for free. Also has a brand new garbage collector and memory allocator. So this dramatically reduces the number of pauses and the duration of pauses to take advantage of new 64-bit architectures. ARM V8, x86-64, and MIP64, GPU performance. Close the gap between desktop DX11 class graphics capabilities and mobile. And what you're about to see is Epic's Unreal Engine 4 desktop rendering pipeline running on Android L on the latest NVIDIA tablet hardware. You want to play? OK. <laughs> Project Volta, to optimize how the expensive subsystems of the device are used and to improve overall battery life. Now you can correlate battery discharge with what was happening to the device at the time. So really all this is to say that Google has been extremely busy cleaning house on the Android platform, not only securing its legal future to protect it from future copyright and patent infringement lawsuits from Oracle, but also by focusing on bringing design and a new aesthetic to the Android platform and hoping to spread that throughout the web. So that wraps up this first half. And in the second half, I wanna go into what Android is bringing to wearable computing, to gaming, uh, to televisions and to uh, web services um, for other developers to use. So it's really a fascinating time to be following these companies. And now with the recent uh, earnings reports, maybe it's time to look at how much money these companies are actually making and how they're planning to make more money in the future. So thank you guys for subscribing. Here's a shout out to all the most recent subscribers. Can't thank you guys enough for all your support, all your great comments. Um, of course, you know, those like buttons help out, but more importantly, just thank you for watching these videos and for listening and giving me feedback. I'd like to hear what you guys think about the future of Android, um, and let's dig into it in the next video. I'll talk to you guys soon.